you in a big class setting. Um, I know this is a challenge uh, for all of us, um, and so thank you for helping us uh, with that. So I'm really interested about what we're going to talk about today because this is a question um, that often conservative Christians are asked, and that is, um, how do we know that the Bible is true? How do we know that our translation of the Bible is true? Um, we, we have uh, two books, a uh, uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, I'm going to pass this around, but uh, you're going to see it's the front page is actually uh, here. Uh, like this is the very uh, front page of the whole thing. Uh, and it reads from the back to the front. Uh, but how do we know that uh, that this is right. I'm going to pass uh, this around. Um, how, how do we know that our translation of that book is right? And how do we know that this book, um, the Greek New Testament, how do we know that these really are the words that were written um, how, how can we have any confidence? I mean, part of that book is claiming to be 3,500 years old. How can, we, how can we be certain that what's printed in that book is right? And everything printed in here is at least 2,000 years old. How can we have any confidence that this is God's word and our translation of God's word uh, is right. So I'm going to pass this around and, and uh, look at it. So the blue one is the, the Greek New Testament. The brown one is the Hebrew Old Testament. But how, how can we know that it's true? How can we know that uh, we have faithful copies? And I don't know, just a show of hands. Uh, have any of you, uh, if, if you're a conservative Christian, have you ever had someone question, well, how do you, how do you know that your translation is true or the Bible is true? Has anyone ever faced that? Uh, um, how, how can you trust a text that is claiming to be 3,500 years old? Uh, and how can I know that my translation of the Bible is right? Uh, how, how, how do you know that it hasn't been like Christianized, uh, that that they kind of haven't glossed over something and and taken a problem and then then fixed it in uh, your Christian uh, translation. So that's what this talk is about. Um, that's what today is about. That's what Wednesday will be about. And so um, we're going to talk about how did we get this brown Hebrew Bible. Um, how is it that we, we have it? And how can I know that my English translation, um, that what it says, that, like uh, conservative translations like the ESV, like the NIV, how can I know for certain uh, that they're accurately representing that Hebrew Bible and that uh, Greek New Testament? And I just will just say something that as a believer, uh, the fundamental starting point that I come to these questions is that God won't let his church be deceived. Um, if God really did communicate uh, his word, he's not going to allow his church to be deceived. He's going to allow us access. That's kind of um, my starting point. And as a scholar... I know that God has given us absolutely enough evidence to know with absolute certainty that what we have is right. That's what we're going to look at uh, today. And we're going to use as our test case an ancient debated example. So th this is the 
broader talk is about how we can be certain, and we're going to use as our starting point one fiercely debated text. And we're going to go through and see the evidence together. So you may know uh, that Jesus, when he died on the cross, in two accounts, uh, he only says one thing from the cross. It's called the cry of dereliction. Uh, it's quoted in um, an ancient language uh, where uh, just seconds before he died, Jesus said, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And his anguish cry was so cracked and halting when he said it that uh, the ear witnesses there uh, actually recorded in two slightly different ways. So uh, Mark records it, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, but clearly it's a quotation of uh, Psalm 21, and Jesus in his dying anguish is saying, if you want to understand what my death is about, go to Psalm 22. And Christians uh, have done that. Uh, if we go th through the uh, gospel accounts, Jesus said seven words from the cross. Father, forgive them. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. The middle one and the only one recorded in Matthew and Mark is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, uh, John tells us, Jesus also said, I thirst and it is finished. And Luke tells us, and uh, Luke tells us, into your hands, I commit uh, my spirit. So the main thing is Jesus' quotation of Psalm 22, and that became the central way that Christians understood what happened when Jesus died on the cross. And there is this text, Psalm 22:16, that talks about the speaker said they have pierced my hands and feet and Christians came to that text and they said how in the world hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented as a means of capital punishment how in the world could Psalm 22 talk about a person being pierced in their hands and feet, unless there's a God who uh, knew the end from the beginning, inspired the text in such a way to point forward to Jesus. And because of Jesus' quotation, and because of this verse, Christians have said, look, this is evidence. This is divine evidence that the Bible is about Jesus and about Jesus' crucifixion. And we even have um, an archaeological account of a person who was crucified. And um, this is the actual heel bone of a person who was crucified. And because nails were so expensive, they would reuse nails. They would uh, drill a hole in the wood and put the nail through and then bend the edge over. For this man who was crucified, they couldn't get the nail out, so they just cut his leg off and threw him in the grave. And he languished, uh, his body languished there in the grave until it was found by archaeologists. When they found it, they realized that this is the way the man was crucified. And so it's evident that uh, some people, when they want, wanted to inflict great shame and uh, great anguish. I mean, think about the kind of pain you have when you turn your ankle, that electric, uh, just that kind of pain. This was what that was designed to do. And so we have evidence of someone who was uh, pierced in their feet. But the problem is not all Hebrew manuscripts read, they pierced my hands and feet. Some manuscripts read, like a lion, my hands and feet. And so uh, many people will say this is just a case where uh, Christians have um, 
have uh, changed the text. And so this has nothing to do with uh, uh, Psalm 16. And this is not the right translation. This is how Psalm 22.16 should be translated. Now, does everyone understand what's going on here? This is, this is a case where there's a textual variant. And uh, Christian translations have said Psalm 22.16 is proof that the Bible is divinely inspired because it speaks about someone with pierced hands and feet hundreds of years before uh, crucifixion was invented. And yet some people are going to say, well, that's not what the text reads. The text doesn't say they pierced my hands and feet. The text reads like a lion my hands and feet. So is everyone is everyone with me kind of why we're bringing this forward, why we're looking at this? This is a key text in terms of textual criticism. This is the one of the key battlegrounds of can we know for sure what this ancient text said. So what we are doing today is called textual criticism. It is a uh, we're criticizing the Bible at all. This is just what they call the science. When you have two manuscripts that have two different readings, when you decide which one is the right reading, you're engaging in what's called textual criticism. If you're uh, a Shakespearean scholar, there's a, a museum right by the uh, Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. that has all the ancient manuscripts of uh, uh, Shakespeare, one of the students uh, uh, who graduated from Bryant actually has a reading card, and, and that's what she does. She looks at those manuscripts. Uh, I've been in the room and seen uh, the books where they do it, and they're practicing textual criticism. How do we know what Shakespeare really wrote? Well, that's what we're doing today with the Bible. How do we know what the Bible really wrote? So we don't have the original copies for anything in the Bible. Those were written on uh, papyrus or on animal skin. Uh, that perished long ago. We don't have that uh, for any document in the Old Testament or any document in the New Testament. Uh, if we did, those documents would be called the autographs. We don't have those anymore. What we have are copies. Uh, Erasmus, when he published his Greek New Testament in 1516, he had seven Greek manuscripts. Um, today we have 5,000 Greek manuscripts. Um, we have uh, 5,000 translation manuscripts uh, today. So textual criticism is the discipline of trying to determine the original reading when you have two different manuscripts that read two different things. That's what this science of textual criticism is called. And when they differ, these are called textual variants. So when we come to Psalm 2216, there are textual variants in that verse. Uh, some manuscripts read, they pierce my hands and feet. Some manuscripts read, like a lion, my hands and feet. There's a textual variant there. And you can see this is an important textual variant. Now, uh, to put that in perspective, uh, when I was a classical Greek student at the University of Georgia, uh, we would read books, uh, and I remember uh, reading uh, Aristotle's Athenian Constitution, and that book starts dot, 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 because we only have one manuscript, and that manuscript is defective, so we don't know what the beginning of it said, so the Oxford edition just starts dot, dot, dot. Um, when you read Plato, we have seven copies of his work, and there's a separation about uh, 1,200 years from when he wrote 
uh, about uh, 400 BC and when we have the first copy. Herodotus, we have eight copies. In the New Testament, we have 5,600 copies. And of those copies, there are 99.5% agreement. Take any manuscript you want, and 99.5% of the time, those manuscripts are going to agree. So wherever the blue uh, Greek Testament is, whoever has it, that's what that is. It's an eclectic text where people have examined every single manuscript, every single word, uh, issued judgments, and then presented exactly what um, uh, the New Testament writers wrote. I have complete confidence in that blue book. I would bet my life on it. That that's exactly what the writers wrote. Uh, the people who study this kind of thing are the smartest people in the world. Uh, they been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. What we have in the blue book, bet your life, that's, that's what the New Testament writers wrote. Um, when I was in England doing my doctoral work uh, in Sheffield, one day a friend of mine and I, uh, several friends, drove over to the John Rylands uh, Library in Manchester, England, and at that time, they had the oldest uh, copy of the Greek New Testament, P52, Papyrus 52, which dates from about 125. And you think, I mean, you know, if John wrote in 70 or maybe 95, you're talking about a manuscript that's only 30 years from when it was written. So Plato, 1,200 years, we have seven. Uh, the New Testament, we have 5,600 uh, some of which are within uh, two or three decades. And I'm told now that this isn't actually the oldest one anymore. It was the oldest one when I was there. Um, some people say we have one from 70 uh, AD now, a copy from Mark. Um, so what we have, we don't, we don't have this anymore, but what we do ha have is maybe something like this. We have... Uh, some early copies, uh, some middle copies, lots of late copies. That's what we have. And so when you're trying to figure out, okay, what was this reading? What you have to do is you have to look at all of them and you have to decide, okay, which one is the right uh, reading. And that's called uh, the canons of textual criticism. And it doesn't matter if you're using uh, Shakespeare or Plato or the Hebrew Bible. They're the same canons. And those canons are the earlier reading is right, probably right. If you have two manuscripts and one's from the Middle Ages and one's from, you know, way earlier than that, it's the earlier reading. Uh, the reading that's most widely represented geographically is the right reading. The harder reading, if you have... An, an easy reading and a hard reading is usually the hard one that's right. Uh, scribes had a tendency to add rather than subtract, so usually it's the shorter one that's right. And the reading that can explain how all the other readings got there, that's the one that's right. And this is kind of the crown jewel of textual criticism. You look at this uh, uh, information, and then this is going to explain uh, what you are uh uh, doing. So can we trust? Well, we have 5,000 uh, uh, Greek manuscripts. We have 5,000 translation manuscripts. Um, some are very close to the time of writing. If we lost all 5,000 manuscripts and all 5,000 translation manuscripts, we could reconstruct the entire uh, Bible from the quotes of the early church fathers. And no point of essential doctrine depends on a textual variant anywhere in the Bible. Uh, you get textual variants like, is it Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? You'll get lots of them like that, but you don't get places where uh, there are 
essential doctrines that depend on a textual variant. We can trust the Bible. Now, when we're talking about the Hebrew Bible, there are four main witnesses. There's what's called the Masoretic Text, and whoever has the brown one, that's what it is. It's one uh, manuscript, manuscript B19A. It's in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, and it's the, called the Masoretic Text. And all printed Bibles are simply uh, faithful reproductions of that one uh, ancient manuscript in St. Petersburg. Uh, there's an uh, ancient Hebrew text called the Samaritan Pentateuch. There, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then there's a thing called the Cairo Geniza, the Cairo Treasury. Uh, we have translations of the Hebrew Bible, uh, four main Greek translations, the Septuagint's the main one, and then we have three revisions of the Septuagint, Aquila, Symmachus, and Theodosian. Uh, we have Latin translations from the 4th century. We have Aramaic Targums, uh, when uh, Israel lost the ability to speak and understand in Hebrew, they developed uh, using a language called Aramaic, kind of like Spanish and Portuguese, if you want to think of it that way, related languages but different. Um, the Bible is translated into Aramaic. And then there's also an ancient uh, uh, Arabic-like translation called the Syriac uh, Peshitta. And those are the texts that tax critics have to look at for um, doing text critical work in the Old Testament. Uh, scholars that I've heard posit a number say that in the Old Testament, 92% of the text is uncontested. So take any manuscript, any translation, 92% of the time there's absolute agreement uh, to what that says. Um, but there is, in the Hebrew Bible, 8% of the time where there are textual variants. Most of the time, the textual variants are something like this. And this is from Psalm 22.1. And uh, this it says something like, the word of my folly. And then this one says, the word of my groaning. And you can see that what's happened is, two letters have been transposed. So you get lots of places where you have textual variants like that, where you have what's called a metathesis of letters. But usually you just go to the text and you can say, oh, this guy misread, he copied it wrong, just like we copy stuff wrong. Uh, you go to the text, you can understand. Here it looks like, oh my goodness, big change, but not really a big change here. We just go and we can look at the ancient text and find out. So what about this uh, pierced my hands and feet? Okay, well, here's the two translations. So the ESV, conservative uh, Christian uh, evangelical translation, says dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Tanakh, which is the Jewish translation, uh, says, Dogs surround me, a pack of evil one closes in on me. Like lions, they maul my hands and feet. Can you see that this is two different readings of the text? So people are coming to the ancient Hebrew text, and Jewish people are saying, well, it doesn't read you know, that sounds very Christian, but that's not the right reading. The real reading is like a lion. Or here they have like lions. Well, what's the difference between those two translations? This is the difference. They blanked. So this is the verb and this is the they part of it. And then... Some manuscripts have the word like and then the word lion. So the difference between those two readings is the length of one letter. Is it this letter 
which is called in Hebrew it called a vav, or is it this letter uh, in Hebrew called a yod? They look exactly the same. One's longer than the other. So this is our textual variant. Can we decide which one David wrote? Is there enough evidence for us to decide the length of one little letter in ancient Hebrew? And I want to argue yes. Let's look at the evidence. So if this is our reading, uh, it means something like they chiseled through or they dug through. It could mean they bound, uh, depending on which uh, root word you think. But chisel, dug, or bound would be how this is read. Um, this letter, uh, Aleph, um, you may or may not know that Hebrew doesn't have any vowels in it. Uh, so, like... In Hebrew, you would have a sentence like uh, like that, and you've got to supply, I love my cat, because they don't have any vowels. You've got to supply your own. So some people think that this olive might be what's called a mater lectionis, a, a mother of reading that say, put an A-class vowel in there. So you're going to get manuscripts that read uh, ka-eru, and you're going to get manuscripts that mean read ka-ru, but those are the exact same reading if Aleph is a Monte Electronis. If you don't get that, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm trying to explain something very complex in too short a time, but the difference is, uh, are, is this a verb, they blanked, or is it like a lion? And you, I hope you have Jewish friends, and if you do have uh, Jewish friends, a very common uh, Jewish name is Ari Shapiro. Uh, Ari means a lion, and Shapiro means beautiful. So Ari Shapiro means the beautiful lion. Well, this is that word Ari. So this, this would be the word like, and like a lion. So you can see how these are two valid ancient readings. They blanked my hands and feet, or like a lion, my hands and feet. Which one is right? Is it a vav, or is it a yod? Well, if we go to manuscript B19A, the Leningrad Codex, uh, the... Uh, text in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia, if we went to that manuscript, this is what the page would look like. If we went to the place on the page, this is what the sentence looks like. And so the question is, is this a yod or is it a vav? You don't have to know Hebrew. You can decide for yourself what this is reading because here's a vav, so that's our long letter, and then here is the short letter. Okay? So in B19A, that's what a vav looks like. In B19A, that's what a yod looks like. So... Which one of these is that letter? So, how many of you think it looks like a vav? All right. How many of you think it looks like a yod? Yeah, it it's a yod. Which means that B19A doesn't read, they blanked my hands and feet. B19A reads like a lion. Now, if you're a conservative Christian, tell me the truth right now. How many of your heart rate went up just a little bit uh, 
in looking at this. It's like, oh man, this looks really bad. Stay with me, okay? Um, because remember, the brown book, and it's on page 1104 if you want to look. I should have said it's where the little marker is. Uh, you can look. This is the reading that they have, like a line. And so Tanakh is saying, pierce my hands and feet isn't in the Hebrew Bible. And they're exactly right. It's not in that brown Hebrew Bible. But remember, the brown Hebrew Bible isn't an eclectic text. The brown Hebrew Bible is simply one faithful copy of one manuscript in St. Petersburg, Russia. B19A reads like a lion. But B19A dates from 1008 AD. When you're talking about ancient manuscripts, that's a fairly recent manuscript. The reason all Hebrew Bibles use B19A is because it's the oldest complete one that we have. And to our shame, we have put up with not having an eclectic Hebrew Bible for 2,000 years. Shame on us. We should have done that work long ago. But do we have other older manuscripts? Remember, one of the canons of textual criticism is not what a manuscript reads, it's what the oldest manuscript reads. So let's start walking backwards. Uh, if we go to the next one, we go to the Aleppo Codex. And it was written in 1030 AD. What does the Aleppo Codex have? Well, uh, we don't know because somebody ripped that page out of the Aleppo Codex. Um, so they stole it. Uh, it's not there. We have no idea what the Aleppo Codex read. Well, what does the Psalm Targum have? And the Psalm Targum, um, they, they do what sometimes uh, translators will do in that they offer what's called a double translation. They don't know how to translate it, so they translate it two different ways, uh, binding how, just like a lion. They're coming to this word and say, you could translate that binders of my hands and feet, or you could translate it like a lion. So it's simply a double translation. They say, we don't know. We don't know which way we should go. But are they reading the Vav, or are they reading the Yod? Clearly, they're reading the Yod. Uh, the Cairo Geniza, a uh, treasure trove of ancient manuscripts, uh, just dozens and dozens, hundreds of manuscripts. What does it read? Well, it reads like a lion in the 6th century. So 1008, like a lion, 930, like a lion. Aramaic Targum like a lion, Cairo Geniza like a lion. And until 1947, the Cairo Geniza was as far back as you could go with the Hebrew manuscript. Uh, so what manuscripts read they blanked my hands and feet? Well, uh, the Latin uh, translate Euxta Hebraeus reads that. Uh, Jerome translated the uh, Latin Vulgate for the Catholic Church. Uh, he did that in the little church where uh, built over the place where Christ was born in Bethlehem. Um, he translated the Vulgate mainly from the Septuagint in Greek, and he gave the uh, Bible, uh, the church a Bible in their own language in Latin, uh, still used today in some churches, uh, Jerome's Vulgate. But because he was living in Bethlehem and he was living around Jewish people, he took that opportunity to learn Hebrew. And five years after he had uh, done the translation, he went back and did a, 
a translation called According to the Hebrews. And in uh, 393, he said that this was what his text read. And so is he reading the Vav or the Yod? He's clearly reading the Vav, but he's translating it not pierced. He's translating it they have bound. They have tied up. And if we had time to look at it, he's doing the uh, Hebrew word from Karah, um, but he's saying this, this is what my manuscript read. It had the Vav, not the Yod. Uh, his Vulgate, he translates it, they dug through my hands and feet. He's reading the Vav, not the Yod. The Old Latin, they have dug, reading the Vav, not the Yod. Aquila says they have disfigured my hands and feet. Now, who is Aquila? Aquila is a man who at one time was a Christian who deconverted. So you, you hear these people all the time, they have a deconversion experience and they tell why they don't believe in Christianity anymore. That's who Aquila was. And Aquila said, it's only the Greek Bible that makes the Old Testament look Christian. If you look at the real Bible, um, you don't end up with Christianity. And so he made a translation and it's called Aquila's translation. And he said that his Hebrew manuscript read Ka Eru. Let me do it right. Ka Eru. So the one that ESV is saying reads Ka Eru. And Aquila said, no, the right reading is ka-eru. Did you hear the difference? Let me do it again. Ka-eru versus ka-eru. Did you hear? Yeah, me either. It's the difference between a, a hard guttural and a soft guttural. But this is a hostile witness. This is someone who doesn't want you to believe in Christianity and this is someone who's telling you, is it a Vav or is it a Yod? And this hostile witness says, it's a Vav. Do you see that? Are you with me? This is important. This is someone who says, Jesus isn't true. Christianity isn't true. But if you want to know the text reading of Psalm 22, 16, it read a Vav. He made a second translation and he said, well, I can't really find any manuscript that has that, but uh, it's Ka'eru, but it means they have bound. So he translates it the same way Jerome did. But in his second translation, is he telling you it's a Vav or a Yod? He's telling you it's a Vav. Here's two times someone who doesn't want you to believe in Jesus, said that the reading isn't like a lion. The reading is they blanked. That's very important evidence. That's evidence from a hostile witness that the text did not read like a lion. But is it enough? Is it enough for us to print this? Symmachus, uh, I don't know what he's reading binders of my hands and feet. I think he's reading this. So clearly he's uh, reading the Yod, seeking to bind uh, my hands and feet. It would be nice if we had Theodosians reading. We don't have Theodosians reading. We don't know. We do have the Peshitta, which is written in ancient Syriac. They read, they pierced my hands and feet. It's the only thing this can mean in Syria. Can't mean they dug through. Can't mean they bound. Reads they pierced. But some people might say, well, we don't know if this is Christian or not. Maybe that's a Christian reading. And I don't know. We Nobody knows who did the Peshitta. We just know it was Jews uh, who did it. Whether they were Christians or non-Christians, we don't know. But the Peshitta reads, they 
uh, peers, all manuscripts in the Peshitta read that. What about the Dead Sea Scrolls? 1947, two old boys were looking for a lost sheep. They threw a rock in a cave. They heard smashing uh, plates. They crawled up in the cave and found the oldest collection of Hebrew Bibles anywhere. That's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the cave that they uh, climbed down in, the hole uh, look like that. Uh, this part of the hole wasn't there. They stood here and threw a rock. This hole wasn't there. They threw the rock in. The plates crashed. They climbed down. They found the, the biggest collection of ancient Hebrew Bibles anywhere, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, ended up, there are 14 of these caves. Uh, they're by far the oldest collection of the Hebrew Bible uh, that we have. And there are two copies of Psalm 22 in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What do those two ancient copies? And remember, these copies aren't Christian and they're, uh, they're at least a thousand years older than B19A. What do the Dead Sea Scrolls read? This is what they read. So when you're dealing with a Dead Sea Scroll, they always give you a number. The first number tells you what cave it's from. So this is from cave four. This is Qumran. Qumran and Dead Sea Scrolls are the same thing. And this is manuscript 88. So this is the 88th manuscript from K4, and it dates pre-70. And what does it read? It reads, they dug through my hands and feet. Does it read the Vav or does it read the Yod? It reads the Vav. And then we have... K56 from Nahal Hever. This manuscript dates from 50 to 100 AD. This is the actual manuscript of um, Psalm 2216. This is our word. This is our letter. So is it this letter or is it this letter? It's this letter. It reads, they pierced my hands and feet. Nobody debates that. Five, six, Nahal Hever reads, they pierced my hands and feet. Nahal Hever is a thousand years older than B-1980. So what happened? What happened is someone around 400 A.D., tried to change the text to change the reading from they pierced my hands and feet to make it not Christian. And because whenever you copy a manuscript, you burn the original, somebody, either through accident or on purpose, had this reading and decided to change it to this reading. And because the original was burned and all you have is the copy, they could turn to Psalm 22 and say, well, my Bible doesn't have, they pierce hands and feet. My Bible, my Hebrew Bible has like a lion. And that's true. And they almost got away with it. But there is evidence. Whenever you try something like that, you're always going to leave a fingerprint. There's always if if we look enough, we're going to find the evidence. And here's the evidence. They pierced my hands and feet. We found it in these two caves called the Cave of Horrors and the Cave of Books. Uh, these people were 
starved to death in 70 AD. Uh, eventually the Romans got into the cave. They killed everybody. They got into this cave. There were all kind of books. They took their swords and uh, rammed them through and tried to cut the pages up, but they left the books there, and they were there until the Dead Sea Scrolls were founded, uh, were found, and then lo and behold, Psalm 22 was in that cave, and so we know that in the first century, it did not read like a line. In the first century, it read, they pierced my hands and feet. And if it reads, they pierced my hands and feet, it means that this is a Christian manuscript, and it means that when Tanakh translates like a lion, they're translating B19A, but B19A does not have the uh, the reason to say that's what David wrote. What David wrote was they pierced my hands and feet. Now, if we went to the Septuagint, translated about 200 B.C., they translated, they dug through my hands and feet. But you can see that the evidence is there. Everybody, in terms of the ancient manuscripts, are reading this letter. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. We've gone through an intensely debated example. This, this is a battlefield that people have been fighting over for century after century after century. And all we did is went to the ancient manuscripts. All we did is went to the ancient versions. All we did is date the manuscripts, and then it becomes crystal clear that this is the right reading. We, In other words, we can determine with crystal clear clarity the length of one letter in the Hebrew Bible. All we have to do is a little work. The people who have done your translations in the ESV, the NIV, the New American Standard, these are people who've done the work. You can absolutely trust your Bible. When I studied uh, textual criticism, I was greatly blessed to study with a man named J. Harold Greenlee. Uh, he participated in producing uh, uh, some of these uh, printed versions, and he was easily the most humble man I'd ever met, and at the same time, the smartest man I ever met. Um, I've I'm 58 years old. I poured my life uh, into studying the Bible. I know a few languages. J. Harold Greenlee knew 65 languages. He had a PhD from Harvard. Uh, he used to joke that he was one of the top five palimpsest readers in the world. And he said, but there are only three people who do it, so I guess I'm in the top five uh, brilliant, devoted his life to stuff just like this. If you can believe any ancient text, you can trust your Bible. You can trust the Greek and Hebrew uh, that we have because people have done this work. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to actually look at Psalm 22. Now that we've established the reading and see just how Christocentric that passage is. So thank you very much, and I will see you on Wednesday.